ICCW. For those who have never been here before, welcome to the Historical Society, and I will get back to that. For those dear friends who have taken the time to come here, please no heckling. <laughs> but thank you. A little, okay, all right, all right. Well, again, thanks for coming. I'm gonna give you a quick overview of the Montana Historical Society. We have five programs, and most people, of course, are only familiar with the museum, because, let's face it, we all like to see great things. And the museum is, is, has sections that are kid-friendly, and so forth. But the reality is we have five programs. The museum, which takes care of three-dimensional objects, and does amazing, I think I just, oh, there's a, Oh, there's a zone. Um, okay, okay. If I go past you, put your hand out. Okay, Lori. Okay. Um, museum. Three-dimensional objects. The wonderful, the wonderful exhibits that we see. Then we have State Historic Preservation Office. They take care of the historical properties around the state, or at least keep an eye on them. Then we have publications. They produce our journal three ti four times a year and a book or two every year. And I had the most recent book on the tip of my tongue. We'll get back to that. Then publications, outreach, and interpretation. And if you've attended a talk like this, they're usually managed by outreach and interpretation. And they, Martha Cole and Ellen Baumler are part of that group. They do a lot of outreach and a lot of things with school kids. And then finally, my territory, where I, I'm comfortable, is the, out, or the research center. The research center, believe it or not, is the largest program for the historical society. We get to play with things, which is part of the reason they don't like me in the museum. But <laughs> we collect and provide access to published material, to the archives, and to the photo archives. All right, so the difference, published material, 95% of the newspapers ever published in Montana. You have access through, through the library upstairs. Unpublished material, I'm trying to think of what I've played with recently. I, I just, I always, when people make it, hearing about her, going in and out. Diane, I'm not, I'm still in the zone. The Evelyn Cameron Diaries. The Evelyn Cameron Diaries are phenomenal simply because she was who she was. She lists the chores she did every day. She talks about what she ate every day. She talks about who visited. She talks about the flu and Glen dive coming back because they had an armistice parade. It's everyday living. When you visit us, you have access to those phenomenal papers, right? It, it's, it, goes, it goes on and on and on. And I would invite anybody and everybody for a tour. I just need a, a few days headway or warning so I can clear a space for tours. I like to let people know if you have in-laws visiting and you don't know what the heck to do with them, then <laughs> bring them to me. Bring them to me. Okay. Now, for those of you who were here a couple moments ago, Let's see if I can do this high-tech thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm going to play part of this song. Ready? He was mighty good. Evelyn right away knew it. This is the new improved version of what you heard a few weeks ago. Now, for those of you 40, you may not recognize it. Evelyn, do you remember who sang this? It was a great balladeer in the 50s and 60s. Anybody want to? Oh my God. <laughs> Lori, I was in awe. Yes, you're right. <laughs> oh, that's funny. All right, let me get out of here now. Close current tab. All right. <laughs> oh, there we go, and we want F5. So Gene Pitney, 
It was the end of the 50s, early 60s, maybe as recent as 61 and 62, there was a wonderful old West, it's old now, a new Western produced. It was The Man Who Shot Liberty Bowen. It starred John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart. John Wayne was a tough guy, Jimmy Stewart was not. And it was all about the different personalities it took to settle the West. And there is a bad guy by the name of Liberty Valance, played by Lee Marvin. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It is just one of the best Westerns ever. The woman, the author of that story, is from And we're going to, she's one of many people that we're going to talk about today. Okay, how much time do I have? I better rein it in. 40 minutes. 40, uh, okay. So, you've probably all seen this before. It's probably kind of an overused feminist tool, but this is not his story today. This is going to be her story. And these are the women I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to try to explain what it took to find their story, because ultimately that is my job, is not playing around with history. And I see Ellen smile. She sees me play way too much. Um, but to teach people how to do historical research, right? So hopefully there'll be a couple lessons in here as well as just your familiarity with these amazing women. So Montana's, Montana's women. Hmm, hmm. I'm getting back in the zone. Okay. <laughs> we have had prophets, we've had frontiers women, we've had cooks, we've had diarists, we've had librarians, we've had widows who raised their kids, we've had mothers who've lost their sons. Every one of those women and every one of us has and is creating a story. So bear that in mind as we, as we go along because not all of these are famous people who made headlines, all right? So the first amazing woman, and I'm, I got a lesson yesterday on how to pro pronounce her name, and I'm not going to be able to say it, but she was a warrior, a prophet, a guy, a courier. However, one of the tricky things about this is everything we know about her was written by another culture. Her people, the Salish, Kootenai Salish, no, excuse me, the Kasenka or the Kootenai tribe have oral history about her, but most, very little of that has been transcribed by Native Americans. It's been transcribed by Anglos. Most of the work comes from the 50s and 60s, and so they have a much different view of her gender than we would today. So, I hope I've got you wanting more. So, 1910, or excuse me, 1810, 1811. We have David Thompson coming down out of British, what would be British Columbia and Alberta and opening up fur trade routes in northwestern Montana, Idaho Panhandle, all the way to Astoria, Oregon. Now imagine, and, and try to give this man the credit he is due, and not to denigrate Lewis and Clark, but Lewis and Clark had not um, had Sacagawea and her babies, and then a whole bunch of military men. David Thompson had his crew of men and his family with him. It's like he had a station wagon in the back of his canoe, and he took his wife and kids with him everywhere. Like I say, credit where credit is due. As they were dropping into what is or was the Kootenai country, one of his colleagues, a Mr. Boisford, married a young Native American woman. And initially, when they met, her name was Lodgepole Woman. Right? And the more current information believes that maybe that was because of her stature, and that stature might play into some of this, and I mean physical stature. Well, in David Thompson's journals, 
He admits that her conduct was then so loose that I had to request Boisvert to send her away to her friends. <laughs> and he doesn't say what loose means. We'd have to get into the vernacular of the time. However, we can guess when we find out that when she returns to her family, the, the Kootenai, she tells them that while she was visiting the white man, she was turned into a man. She changes her name to Gone to the Spirits, and I will now call him Gone to the Spirits. During the course of the next 15 years or so, Gone to the Spirits marries, becomes a very, very successful courier. That means he would take messages from David Thompson, who's in the Columbia Basin, to Astoria to keep the communications going, was a successful fur trader, and he predicted the future for many of the villages that he visited. Now, make of this what you want, but he often predicted that there would be illness. And for historians, and for many of you who read about the West, sadly, our Native, the Native Americans were hit with smallpox and every other European illness that you can imagine on a regular basis. So, profit or not, he did tell them this was happening. He also was a mediator between the Salish, or what was commonly known as the Flathead tribe, and their mortal enemies, and when I say mortal, it's no exaggeration, the Blackfeet. Sometimes he, so gone to the spirits, would battle with the Blackfeet, and sadly that is what happened. Gone to the spirits with a small group of Kootenai were traveling along the, what we consider the Clark Fork River. Everybody know where Plains, Montana is? If you don't, by golly, you need to go up there. Near what is today Plains, Montana, there was an altercation. According to oral tradition, it took many, many Blackfoot, Blackfoot warriors to bring Gone to the Spirits down. So that's the first amazing person. And now, as I, before I exit that, I want to, then I should have introduced, many of our Native American tribes had the view that a person could be born with, let's say, the genitalia of a female, but born with the spirit of a man. Not all groups were very understanding. It just depended on, on the dynamics. Every, every group, every clan, every tribe has its, its, its own processes. If you go to the Crow, um, the, there's a term that I hesitate to use because it was pejorative, but most of the literature under this is under this title, the Burdash. They're called Burdash. And the Crow, there were several Burdash when there were turn of the century anthropologists studying the crow, and so we have a lot of information on them, but sadly none of them are as intriguing as Gone to the Spirits. All right, but speaking of David Thompson and the fur trade, there were so many fur traders that formed alliances with Native American women for a myriad of reasons. Of course, the first that comes to mind is just to have a workmate and a partner, but it also made good business sense. You've got someone who not only can speak her own language, hopefully yours and surrounding tribal people's languages. And such, one of these matches was made between Alexander Culbertson and Natuista. He was 30 years older than she was. But I am going to argue that this was quite the match. And there's a lot of information on, on these two because of the timing. So they married, let's see, trying to get a, a timeline for you. Yeah, 1840, in the Fort Union area. By, 19, by 1850, they are celebrating Christmas at Fort Benton and christen it. Fort Benton. 
they are in some articles called the king and queen of the Missouri. She is credited with being, one book is called Frontier Diplomats, and indeed she was. And I want to say she had to have been incredibly smart, incredibly wily, but homesick when you read about them, okay? She not only met, and this is, this is just a few of the people she met, Pierre Chaudot, Father de Schmidt, Audubon, Prince Maximilian, it goes on and on. Anybody who brought, who came up the Missouri in a steamboat and got off of Fort Benton would have met Culbertson and Natuista. Now, we've got then a minister who is one of the, he might have been one of the first, if not the first Protestant minister to come to what someday would be Montana. He met her and says she was a very, and this is a quote, a very remarkable woman. Her influence on Mr. Culbertson seems to be of the most favorable kind. There's often mention of her influence on her husband. I find that interesting. In, 19, in 1851, she and her husband attended the signing of the Fort Wayne Treaty, and she is credited with acquiring a lot of the information that was being discussed with the Native Americans because she always camped away from the European camps, and so Native American peoples felt more comfortable coming and visiting her. And in some, there are some journals where they talk about her having women's talk, and we all know that women's talk isn't just about having babies. In 1853, she accompanied what assumed to be Governor Stevens and her husband and her crew on a surveying trip. And Stevens wrote that she rendered the highest service to the expedition, a service which demands the public acknowledgement. They had five children. The second drowned in the Missouri, and after that, the children were sent back east to boarding schools, but every year, now think of this, there's no trains yet. It's steamboat or horse or stage. I guess stage is horse. They went, they went back east to visit their children. I think that's very telling. They went back to the states, as they were called. Believe it or not, they were able to, they attempted to retire. Oh, that's the next woman. I say that seemed a little late. They attempted to retire in 1858, and they moved to Peoria. They built a home that made the local news because they did not bar any expense. The home and their goings-ons were reported in the local newspapers, including the fact that towards the end of the summer, Natuista would often put a teepee on their finely manicured lawns and spend the nights in it. it just, she, was, she was homesick. She was homesick. They bowed to convention while they were there and made a big production of being married by a priest, so they were legal by the state's standards. Sadly, by 1869, the bottom falls out of their fortune. They had done some risky investments, which was very common at that time, and they ran out of money and they came home. But between 1858 and 1869, a lot had changed in Montana. We were now a territory. There was a lot of unrest between tribal peoples and the Europeans. And in 1870, in January, there is the Marias River Massacre. And this involved many of Natuista's people. So there's speculation that she just had enough of Europeans, couldn't blame her. But that year, she returned to her, her Blackfoot roots. And he is left a little aimless, I'd say a lot aimless, and winds up Passing away in 1879 in Nebraska, he'd been living with a daughter who had settled there. And she lives till 1893 and dies in Canada among her. But an amazing woman. Oh my goodness. Okay, now the next two, 
This is the new improved version for those of you who saw me a few weeks ago because, um, what can I say, I got to reading and realized, oh, wait a minute, there's a great connection here. So, uh, Nanny Alderson gets a bad rap, but I have to give credit to anybody, no matter what day and age, who will write a book and laugh at themselves. And Mrs. Alderson does that. She marries a man from Miles City in... Da, 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 da. Yeah, for mixing... In 1883, she had been born and raised with an influential family in Virginia. Now, one of the things she gets slammed for is the fact that she, she is a very typical of 1880s. She's very prejudiced. She grew up with African-American servants. She didn't understand the native peoples here, and she sadly makes that clear in her reminiscences. However, she also talks about attempts to make a go of it on the Montana frontier. And I'm going to read some of the things in her reminiscences. And by the way, it's called A Bride Goes West. And it is, it's just a fun read. She says, I went with romantic ideas of being a helpmate to a man in a new country, but I was sadly ill-equipped when it came to carrying them out. Before I left Union, a dear old lady had taught me how to make hot rolls, but except for that one accomplishment, I knew no more of cooking than I did of Greek. That was my whole equipment for conquering the West. Sorry, you gotta love it, gotta love it. Some more of her writings. Let's see. Sometimes I wonder if too much hasn't been said with, about the grim aspects of frontier life. Later on in my marriage, I came down to hard, bare facts, to loneliness and poverty. But that first spring and summer, I was anything but lonely in spite of the lack of women. I had much to learn and hard work to do. Then she goes on to explain that it was actually some of her husband's cowboys who taught her to cook. And that is where the best part of her reminiscences comes up. It's her first Christmas. And rumor has it, the ranch is outside of Mile City. Rumor has it that there's canned oysters to be had in Mile City. So she sends someone into town to get canned oysters, and she says there's no turkeys to be had, so you had to have canned oysters if they were available. They come back, and I think she might have made scalloped oysters. She doesn't really get into that. But she provides a feast. She's the only woman there. She brings out the crystal. She brings out her grandmother's linens. And there's all these cowboys, and I can only imagine them just loosening their collar and, and anxious for a good meal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here we go. I doubt if there was a turkey in Montana that Christmas, but we had oysters. On each side of the bowl, I had grandmother's silver candlesticks and white doilies. While my husband carved the beef, or the beef roast, I helped everybody generously to oysters. I did not notice that after the first explanation of, think of oysters on a cattle ranch in Montana, nothing was said. But when my husband finished serving and tasted the oysters, he said to me, what's the matter with these oysters? And I fear that some of the guests ate more than was wise, just to spare my feelings. I didn't report on how sick some of us, I needn't report on how sick some us were before morning, for the oysters evidently had been tainted before they were frozen. We did have a merry time before the disaster effects began to take effect. <laughs> so, Nanny and her husband sadly could not make it on the ranch, and they wind up moving to Mile City. He dies very early and leaves her with four children. And then, according to the census and other reports, she does everything to support those kids. She runs a boarding house. There's some time where they go out to the ranch, especially after the kids get a little older, in hopes of making a go of it. But this is one tough woman. And she did not, she lived to be 84. So, but one of those cowboys at that table 
was Mr. Z okay. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's Mr. Brown. Was married, going to be married soon to Laura Brown. So this is Laura. Excuse me. I'm getting my name mixed up. Right. So Laura remembered vividly coming to Montana because she was 10 years old. Her stepfather, Mr. Brown, had come ahead of the family. He had had a lot of adventures. Oh my gosh, some might question as being true, but what can I say? Um, let me get my sources down here so I am actually telling the truth and not spinning those yarns like Mr. Brown. There she is. Okay. I, I love her. She did write some reminiscences. We have them in our collection. And it's very interesting when you read what she says and then what is said in her obituary. It's like a fishing story. They just go. But we do hear her voice in her reminiscences. So it was in June 1878 when her mother and sister arrived in the area. This is before before trains, in the area that would someday become Miles City. And I love the way she puts this, because of course it becomes grandiose in the first family and blah, blah, blah. But in her rep um, reminiscences, she said that they had the honor of being the first family to spend the night on the sagebrush flat destined to become Miles City. <laughs> so you go from that to the founders of the city, but anyway. I'll leave that up to you. She was sent back east because she loved learning. And by the time she was 17, she had passed two different exams to give her teaching certificates. I've seen those exams. I couldn't pass them. And here I am talking. You should be worried. <laughs> she then came home. She taught in Lame Deer. She taught along the Tongue River, and she was in a one-room schoolhouse during the, the hard winter of 1886 and 87. In 1889, she married John Zook. They had one son, but by 1900, she was widowed and never did remarry. Shortly after her husband passes away, she runs for the county superintendent of schools, and she does two terms. And just about the time she's done with that second term, Miles City gets his Carnegie Library. She was librarian for 40 years. After she retired, she visited the library every day it was open. And I can only imagine the new librarians thinking, here she comes again. <laughs> but until she went into the hospital shortly before she passed, she visited that place every day. And she would have been passing Mrs. Alderson in the street and they would have been, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Both of these ladies were widows and trying to make a go of it. Both of them were go-getters. Go I just think Montana is a pretty spectacular place. All right. I'm not sure I would have ever wanted her mad at me <laughs> from the looks of that. Let's see who's next. Oh, yeah. So in this, I do feature the Sinclair family. But this is my homage to all the, all the families in Montana's history that have lost people to our wars. We sometimes have a, a mechanism that allows us to kip, skip fast forward before we start talking seriously about loss. So going into World War I, there was a tradition where a family that had a son or a husband or a father who was in the military had a little banner and it had a blue star on it. And when and if that man was lost, a gold star was stitched over the blue star. The women who lost sons became known as the gold star mothers. And there was a woman who had lost a son and quite honestly wanted more. And she began lobbying the federal government, and the Gold Star Mother Program was created specifically 
because so many men were not able to be buried at home. And so you have a generation of women who cannot visit their sons' and husbands' graves. In 1930, 1930, so the war ended in November of, of 1918, 12 years after she loses her son, Anna Mae Clark Sinclair from Baker, Montana, is amongst a group of women who go to France. Her, her son, her oldest son, has been killed in the Argonne, and she visits his grave. Now, what's exciting about this is the Baker paper, she's front page news, and she gives a wonderful, wonderful interview of her experience as a Gold Star mother. And so, to me, that's the heritage that she has left us. There were several other women that qualified, 66 women in all from Montana qualified to be Gold Star mothers, but that's out of 1,400 casualties from Montana. So, and she didn't lose, she was not alone in her grief. This is her husband and he was the blacksmith in Baker. When she passed away, she still had two living children and a whole passel of grandchildren. And I can only imagine that she did for them. And then another group, the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Now, I've been talking about different sources. This is my favorite source. You ready? It's a cookbook. I think this cookbook may be home now. I can't swear to it. But if you read about the Smithsonian and you're one of those people who really loves history, the Smithsonian a while back had a special exhibit on African American history, and they borrowed this cookbook from Montana. That was on exhibit at the Smithsonian. I'm going to talk about the root cookbook real quick. Someone might have to kick me and stop me, Evelyn. Okay, um, if I get too, too, verb, too verbal about this and going on. So the cookbook is a typical community cookbook. The Federation created a cookbook to make money. But what is special about this is not only the fact that we have a list of the members from this group, but they, in their introduction, they remind people that these are going to be darn good recipes because after all, this is how most of us make our living is by cooking for other people. That speaks powerfully to me. We also hear at the Historical Society, the Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, when they closed the door on that club because of lack of pop African American population, they entrusted the Historical Society with their records. They are downstairs in the archives. Again, some of those, no, we don't play with them, but we, <laughs> we study them. But this group, so just a little, little bit of specifics about this amazing group of women. It was not just a social club. We already talked about Gold Star Mothers. So it was a significant population of African Americans in Montana. But after the Second World War, that population declined drastically. But the Federation of Negro Women's Clubs first met in Butte, it's always Butte, isn't it? In 1921, but before that, there are at least nine formal groups throughout the state meeting. All right, so they became official and became affiliated with the national group. Their goals were to earn funds for scholarships to help black high school students attend colleges. They lobbied for civil rights legislation in the state legislature. Specifically, in 1951 and 50 through 55, they had a committee that worked on a bill to ban segregation in public places. This takes a lot of nerve. And they worked through a variety of programs to improve racial relations at the state and local level. Now, this is in their bylaws. You ready? 
to encourage true womanhood and to promote interest in social uplift. Five principles. Courtesy, justice, rights of minority, one thing at a time, majority rules. Hmm. They did disband right around 1970. Oh. Uh oh, I bumped something. Diane. There it is. Oh, phew. never mind. It's like having a guardian angel back there. Now, I, it occurred to me that I needed to talk about athletes. So, what better group of athletes to represent Montana than the Greeno sisters? Oh my gosh. Have you met, did you meet them? Yes. Did you? Amazing women. So the Greeno sisters started writing rodeos in the 20s. And they made quite the names for themselves. I'll give you a couple of specifics here in a moment. Now I'm told the way to, to tell them apart, but you can't in that, in that or these, but I know that this is Marge because she's smiling. And I sent this picture to a niece. And she said, oh, that has to be my Aunt Marge because she's smiling. Aunt, Aunt um, Anne was always a little more somber. So some of the information, and, and because they now are in, in the information age, we know so much about the Greenos, probably more than they wanted us to know. But one of them reported that well, they were they were born they weren't born they were raised on a ranch near Red Lodge. And they all learned to ride horses in a pole corral with a dirt worn rock, rock base. And Marge says that's the reason we all became good riders. Nobody could get bucked off in those rocks and live. <laughs> Both Marge and oh Alice, excuse me waitress at a Red Lodge restaurant, saving money to buy a, bike, a motorcycle that took them to every rodeo. They soon joined the Jack King Rodeo Show. Myrtle, their mother, disliked the idea, but their dad, Ben, thought it was a darn good one. Alice rode her first bronc in 1919 at the Forsyth Rodeo. Five years later, five-year younger sibling, Marge, won a race at the Red Lodge Rodeo, and there was no stopping them from that time on. Alice specialized in trick riding, eventually owning and breeding her own stock, while Marge focused on bareback and steer riding. Both women, as athletes do, in, endured so many broken bones I lost count as I was reading. They rodeoed from Red Lodge to Madison Square Garden. The, one, this particular newspaper article reported that a day with Alice Greeno, full of more than enough for someone with less energy. <laughs> Both were inducted into the Cowgirl Hall of Fame in 1983. And again, hats off to the Greeno girls. Oh my gosh. There's so many women out there who deserve to have their story told. And none more than Minnie Spotted Wolf, England, hyphen England. So Minnie was born and raised on a ranch near Square Butte. Shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor, she tried to enlist and was told by the enlistment um, officer that little lady, the war is no place for a woman. But she persevered and in 1943, she got essentially her marching orders and she was the first Native American woman to join the Marines Women's Branch. What is, there's so many amazing things about Minnie. This is one of the people I wish I had met. She made national news. A national women, young women's magazine called the US Girl or something equally, calling all girls, had a what we would have been called a comic center, and we call it graphic novels now, but I'm going to call it comic. And we had a school teacher who was familiar with Minnie come in several years ago, and she wanted to know where our copy was of this magazine. We didn't have one. And about six months later, one came in the mail, and I don't know how many hours she had to spend on eBay, but she made certain the historical society and the people in Montana had a copy of this. So 
I remember, I think I was with Martha Cole when it came in and we looked, we opened this because we weren't, we were so worried of how Minnie and her family would be portrayed. And it is done so beautifully and just like every other family in the country would have been represented. It just shows quite honestly how rough ranch life is. And interestingly enough, I think on some levels that's what caught a lot of people's attention was coming from a ranch in Montana, that old crazy Montana mystique. But she went on to serve four years and she returned to Montana and she really was a member of the greatest generation. She came home, she went to school, and she went back home and taught for almost 30 years. Her, she married a farmer by the name of Mr. England. I, I should look up information on him, I guess, <clears throat> next time. And they had four children. She was buried with her military uniform on. Amazing. OK, back to Liberty Valance. How many of you have seen the movie? See, I, I know I'm old, but come on. Is anybody under, uh-huh, uh -huh. man who shot Liberty Valance? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Hanging Tree? Uh, uh, man, uh, a man called Horse? I, I, I see some people nodding. So, blockbusters. All of them were blockbusters. The Hanging Tree had Gary Cooper. And then oh, Richard Harris played a man called Horse. The author of those stories was Dorothy Johnson. She, her parents moved to Whitefish before Whitefish was everybody's destination. It was pretty much probably a one-pony town when she was raised there. She gets, started working for local newspapers, sold her first story to the Saturday Evening Post, I want to say in 35. Yeah, 35. And then in the 50s, she produced some of her best known stories. She is responsible, along with a few other choice authors, for how Montana was and continues to be perceived by the rest of the world. A lot of romanticism, but she did like to play tricks with her literature. The sharp shooting, fast drawing sheriff was not the hero of her stories. It was usually the man or the woman who was just trying to survive and did what they had to to survive. And after you watch those movies, I know you're all going to rush out and get them. Um, she, ooh, I'm over time. Um, she does write a lot about how her stories were changed. The Hanging Tree is all about the female character, if you read it, instead of Gary Cooper, although Gary Cooper's Gary Tro Cooper. She loved her independence, and I, I like this. She, her, her motto was paid in full, and her grave reads paid. She taught in Missoula, taught creative writing, and I'm going to have to get going here. I'm sorry. Last person. Cookbooks. <laughs> How many have a, a Betty Crocker cookbook at home? All right. This is Jeanette Kelly. She was born and raised in Deer Lodge, Montana. Her parents were from the area. Grandma lived down the street. Her aunt lived across the street. And in the social section of the Deer Lodge paper on a regular basis, it says, the senior class or the junior class or gathered at the Kelly home. And Jeanette, as is custom, served them great food and they all had a great evening. So she had a calling for cooking and hostessing. She graduated from the University of Montana Extension Service Program and Home Ec Program in 1972. Ah, interesting timing. She works for what would soon become the Extension Office. She specializes, she is based in Stillwater County, but the newspapers talk about her outreach and, and billings and all these amazing places. Well, she was coming from Deer Lodge. I think it was an amazing place. Um, 
But a lot of her wood was work was focused on children. And that gets the attention at the turn of the decade of a group back east that would eventually be labeled the Betty Crocker Company or the Gold Medal Flower Company. And they hire her, and she writes a book on baking bread for young people. She then starts moving around. If you're familiar with old women, old women, I, let me see, older magazines produced for women. There's the delineator. She worked for the delineator and created recipes and produced recipes, et cetera, et cetera. But by the mid 30s, late 30s, she has gone back to gold medal, and she and a couple of other women create, here's a, here's a concept, test kitchens. They standardize recipes. Some of us remember chiffon cakes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chiffon cake was a big deal because it um, used oil instead of lard or shortening. And it was a hybrid between an angel food cake and a regular cake. And they're quite tasty, actually. But she managed to get the patent for that. That recipe was actually first created by a man in California. But they produced one of her first cookbooks under the auspices of uh, Betty Crocker and gold medal then was the chiffon cookbook. She was a mover and a shaker. She was all about science and organization and creativity. And she was the powerhouse and her kitchens that she managed for the production of one of the best-selling cookbooks ever. This came out in 1950. Not anywhere in that book will you find her name. As far as people are concerned, Betty Crocker was real and Betty Crocker did all this work. She was a powerhouse. And she's so much fun to read about. All right. So. Some of my favorite people up there. And as I collect these stories, I'm constantly reminded that everybody I come into contact with has a story. And our, all of our stories deserve to be written down, they deserve to be told, and they deserve to be shared. And if you out there have not shared your stories with your children, with your friends, with your grandchildren, it's easier with grandkids, I'm gonna, I, I have to admit. Do it, or put it on your to-do list. Because women's stories are out there, and we would not be where we are without women right next to those men that have made history. Any questions? I didn't get kicked.